Uh, on behalf of my team in health intelligence, I want to run through what we've learned for the last 10 to 12 years in terms of trying to use data in Ireland in a novel way. So the problem here is that uh, you start with one patient who visits the GP at the hospital, or born in the hospital, and all the data starts off in one place. What happens then, over time, the data becomes scattered to the four winds, and basically each sort of data set becomes a little world in its own little orbit. So hospitals, primary care services, laboratories, imaging, the states, the state schemes, health registries, patient portals, the data is just scattered across the universe. So the challenge of big data, in, in our perspective, is as follows. First of all, we have these silos of data. Individual islands with no bridges between them. Secondly, we use different classification systems in different places, different coding systems. The data content and quality can vary hugely between different places for the very same conditions. We have tried to bring in unique identification of the same patient across the service, but at the moment, each of us probably carries multiple identifiers in different places. The whole geography side of things, uh, at the moment, the county is probably the smallest unit of geography in this country. So that's a huge area. So Dublin is one county. Um, with the advent of the air code, though, we hope that the geocoding concept of healthcare can be more refined in the future. One of the biggest problems you have is data access. The data might actually exist, but to actually get your hands on it can be extremely difficult and costly. Then we've got the problem of ownership. Who actually owns the data? Who governs it? And in terms of GDPR and the whole governance that's been sort of magnified in the last couple of weeks or months in terms of that, cause a certain uh, degree of uncertainty. And we have a culture of use, or perhaps a culture of non-use of data in this country, I would suggest. And the whole idea of record reassociation, of bringing the data back together about the same patient is quite challenging. So that's a radar system. If you didn't have a radar system, if you looked out of the wind of your airplane, that's what you probably see next time around, complete chaos. So I wonder which of these is more resembling our health service at the moment in terms of data. I suggest it's probably the one. So just a little bit of history. This man, John Snow, lived in the mid-1850s, mid and he, he saw this dreadful wave of cholera sweeping across where he worked in Wales and London. This problem hit the cities every so often across the world, the big cities. And he observed what was going on here. And he looked at counts of deaths. He produced maps of where people died. He took maps of water systems. And he figured out by observation that there's a common link, a common pattern here between people who got ill and died and those who didn't get ill, who didn't, get, who didn't die. So he worked out that the common cause here was they shared something and once one person got it, they could transmit it to somebody else in the same household. So he figured out water was a common cause here. So this is kind of the basic root cause analysis. So by looking at patterns by person, place, and time, and coupled with incredible intuition and deduction, he figured out the way to stop this problem basically was to take away the source of the water to the population. So he said, here, here, here his, at the background here is the map that he drew of cases that died from cholera just down the street from where he worked. Every little line is a death. So in a tenement house, the whole pile of deaths, and so on and so forth. He went out on a horse and asked the people, where did you go to get your water? And other questions. And the common factor was they all went to this pump, Broad Street pump, in London. There was an outbreak further away, and as people said, well, ah, John, hang on a second. There's an outbreak up there. They didn't go to this. They didn't live around here. That disproves your theory. Out he went on his horse and asked them, where did you go and get your water? They actually came in to this part of London to get water from that pump. So he put it all together, all the science, all the stories of the time, and said, if you take away the source of this water, that will sort, sort out the problem. Do you think he was believed at the time by his peers? No, not for a long, long time. But he figured this out before the microscope of the microbe, before the microscope was conceived or a microbe was ever seen. He figured this out in the absence of perfect data. And the key to this is that you can do an awful lot of good work with imperfect data. So as James said, what do we do in health intelligence? Well, we try to support the quest for better health for patients, families, and the public by exploiting the potential available data. So that's the key word, potential of available data. If the data isn't available, there's no potential. 
So just to remind ourselves of, of what, this, what, what is data. Well, data is, to me, just simple, boring facts and figures sitting in the filing cabinet on a computer. Information, information makes it a bit interesting, maybe a report. We operate the next one, intelligence, stuff that's actually actionable. You can do something with the knowledge you've got. So the whole concept of Health Atlas Arden, which is the case study today, is how can we help people ask the right question, access the best available data, to carry some sensible analysis, and often simple analysis, so you get some simple result and a good answer, that you interpret it, that can inform decision making. That's basically our role. So the early days, we, the, the, the term Actus uh, started from when we were interested in maps and where things uh, occurred and why they didn't occur in certain places and other places they did have problems. A bit like John Snow. But an Atlas effectively is a collection of maps. And maps show where you are and how to get to where you want to go. So we stuck with the name. It's been rather, very relevant. In those early days, um, we were you know, single user with a single computer, a bit of software. We did output work, and then if you moved on to a different job, it was all lost. There was very little interaction between one person and other people. So we got together with a lot of these good folk, and we designed this thing in the in boom times, designed for the hard times. The whole idea is to, uh, to, to help people analyze complex or big, nasty data, big data sets, <coughs> and just raise simple intelligence without too much effort. And start off with a grant in 2004 from the HRB. That was the, the trigger to it all. We had to go to, out, out to tender to the European Union uh, machinery and kicked off in 2006, and here we are today. So I'll run through some of the things we developed in the last couple of years. What we had to do was to design a solution, a bit like JC just said a moment ago in terms of Scotland. We had to come up with a solution to control people to get into the data. So user access control, passwords, usernames, who they work for, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, we had to pull together into our own private cloud the data, the data sets that we thought were important. So we have a private cloud, effectively. We then had to have tools for people to analyze the data in some kind of way. A very sort of simple ad hoc, a very structured standardized format, or right into the guts of it through R as a stats package three options, to end up with tables, maps, and exported data, effectively. The interfaces over there on the, on the left-hand side, these are all the, the main modules that we provide to the, the health service, the HSE in particular. <coughs> People spend their lives collecting data for various purposes, particularly in hospitals, primary care centers, etc. The next step is to access that data to be collected. That, as I said a moment ago, was can be extremely difficult and costly. Our work starts here, where we try to analyze this stuff in terms of counts and stats, and then display it in some sensible way. So we spend our entire lives on the last two steps here, assuming other people have done the other two. We had to come up with a design where we control access to all the data sets, to a particular agency, to its department or section, to the, user, to the particular users, in a controlled way, so the right people saw the right data sets at the right time. In terms of governance, the data sits on a server, not on a PC. That's a huge change from the old days. We don't allow patient identifiers on board at all. No names, no addresses, etc. No dates of birth. Secure web access. People have to sign up. They have to sign their name to, to, a, to, a, to a forum with their boss to, to kind of sign it. There's role-based access in terms of who you are, what you can do. We do, do not enable record linkage because it can't be done the way we designed it. We consult with DPC going through. Uh, we're very GDPR, GDPR aware. We can give people access to a portal of data set, as just be mentioned in Scotland, and we can suppress small numbers, et cetera, et cetera. The whole software story here is built actually in open source software. Now, it happened we had to tender that open source company won the, won the contract in collaboration with Siemens Ireland. Uh, so all the, the, the databases, the stats, the mapping stuff, all that stuff is all on open source software. So we don't have costs to actually run the software on our systems. So what data base, taught data sets to be played with? Well, we have sensors on board with vital importance. We've done this country every five years, which is fantastic. We have hospital uh, data, roughly 1.7 million records per year. Prescribing data, which you have to use for a wee while now, but 72 million records a year. Uh, road crashes, births, uh, mortality, cancer, perinatal, finance, HR, environment, to some extent, disability, and survey data. It goes on and on and on, and gradually growing over time. The whole issue of geocoding we leave for today we have all the maps from the OSI, 
Uh, we have all the boundary data in terms of counties, health service areas, hospital areas, et cetera, et cetera. And we have think all the service directory that we created and gifted over to HSE IT in terms of where the hospitals, health centers, GPs are in this country. It starts off with somebody writing a specification of what they want to do. So it's written, and pictures, what it should look like, and mathematics of codes and that kind of stuff. So I'll just touch on maybe three or four examples of what you get at the end of the day. And this is called the finder. So everybody who's access to the atlas has access to this. So it's a very simple concept. You put in your address in there somewhere and onto the map and you get your, all the catchment areas that your house or your business is associated with in terms of primary care teams, networks, CHOs, etc., etc. Touch another button and you say, okay, I want to get the profile of my area. Out comes a profile, age group, deprivation, language, that kind of stuff from the CSO. And you are compared to the, to the national census, previous census, and today and the difference. So all that's done for you in terms of planning data. That's extremely important. And maps of deprivation by small area. Small area actually is the size of a small housing, housing estate, about 100 houses. It's very, very fine-tuned deprivation maps that we can produce. In terms of service mapping, this is the kind of work we often do to help people decide where to put things, like where would you put a pediatric hospital, a primary care center, where are there gaps of general practitioners, maps of density and deprivation. That's Dublin, and it shows you roughly where people live. This middle map here is a map where we geo-referenced hospital data for a year, some time back, and that's the catch and dirty in purple of Vincent's Hospital, where most people live and go to Vincent's, Vincent's Hospital, somewhere around there. That's James's Hospital, and that's Tala. That's the matter, and that's um, Beaumont, and that's Connolly. So it lets, you, it lets planners see where do patients come from to our services. There's another way to look at the world where we can draw distances along roads or time along roads from certain centers, say for cardiology or for trauma centers, and I can count people under each zone, decide well, where is the best balance to put these centers that are nearest most people at any one time. The resource analyzer is a piece of kit that um, basically replaces weeks of effort um, in a university at a huge cost in terms of deciding the balance of staff and service across, across the country. So if I'm trying to count, say, probably nurses or doctors, whatever, I get a count of those staff by the area of, of relevance. I'll put it into this simple spreadsheet. I know that the greatest determinant of health need is always population size, the sheer total size of the population. is 1 million, 2 million. That's the first thing. Second is this age profile. So more elderly people, more kids, more services required. And number three is deprivation. And everything else is way down somewhere out of sight. So what this tool does, it allows you to count the staff. It allows you age weight and deprivation weight at the same time. So you put in your staff numbers. That one might take you a number of minutes if somebody can give you the, the data. You put in your weighting by age, so this is classically what happens here is a certain increase in use of service by children, and it shoots up over the age of 50, 60, 70, 80, like that. Some shape like that. These are default values based on hospital utilization, but you put, all, put your no, all num own numbers in if you have them from your own data from abroad. That's a classic deprivation kind of weighting. So the more affluent, lower use of services, and as you go down, down the, the ranks to more, to more deprived, two or three or fourfold increase in use of services. So you put in those numbers, those numbers, those numbers, and you wait about two minutes, and you get a result out to show you the relative weight of your population against your staff, your staff commitment. And it allows you to readjust to get the balance right if things are out of kilter. And allows you to look at your population projections going forward for the next 25, 30 years, all in one kit. So that's getting tremendous traction in HSE as we speak for obvious reasons, because you can't get your staff in the right place, ergo you've got inequity in your service, in your service provision. The NICWIS story, which I'll just touch on briefly, um, they are nothing to do with maps at all. Again, what it does it exploits data, particularly in the hospital environment? So what it does, it takes maybe five years of three or four, maybe three or four years of hype data, which is four or five million records, it allows you to use a very, interfa very simple interface to get a pattern of interest. So here's the classic top buttons to this system, where you've got maybe six or seven buttons where you want to choose certain diagnosis, certain age group, whatever it might be, a certain hospital or hospitals, um, a certain procedure of interest. 
and you want to see certain things in, in the white buttons there. So you just press those buttons, and off it goes, and produces these nice patterns of volume of people, how close your service is to sort of target length of stay, whatever it might be, and the proportion of, say, in this case, bed days that are very well used, well used, not so well used, in terms of proportions against your peers. Produces nicely simple charts in terms of for each diagnosis, how well you use your beds for different conditions in this country. It's so very simple stuff uh, to ask for but up to now was not actually available till, till very recently. And you can explore your patient profiles, you can touch, you know, live dead, the whole thing just changed in front of you in terms of the profile of your patients. And then with a finger, you can actually just cross tab, say age group by mortality or clinical team by mortality, this kind of stuff, very simple stuff. So it takes the heavy lifting out of complex data. It's been applied in, that's, this is a clinical story in terms of length of stay and readmission re re rates mortality in hospitals, endoscopy services, radiology, hospitality, they all are kind of similar concepts of doing something standardized in a simple way for frontline staff. We're applying this technique to the big data sets behind the scenes where, be it a hospital data set or prescribing, you can choose effectively your, param your parameter of interest, period of geography, what you want to do with it, and what results you want. Again a simple row, set of buttons and buttons, and you get your table, your results to the maps. It takes a huge effort of learning a stats package, learning the data set. It's kind of pre-packaged for you in a very simple way, and off you go in terms of what you can do with it afterwards. This is just another, another example of mapping where we layer in maps from OSI, the background, electronic maps. We layer in buildings from GeoDirectory, which are about two million in the country, the yellow dots. And we layer in the power lines from ESB uh, networks. There's about, what is it, 900, well, a vast number of lines across the country. So the first time all these were brought together in a single mapping system. And you probably wonder why we do that. Well, if you're flying a helicopter and you want to land a certain field, it's nice to know there isn't a wire nearby. Or there is which side the field is on, so you come in from the right direction. So when this service started off initially, we were asked, um, oh, you're the, you're the mapping guys in, in the HSE, could you, could you abuse? We're, we're, we've closed down a hospital in the west of Ireland, and um, the decision was made to bring in a, a helicopter, an air, an air medical helicopter service, but we, we liked some electronic maps, could you do something for us? So up until that point, the pilots would have had a paper map on their knees, the size of a kind of a you know, tourist map. That's what they would use to navigate and decide where to go. So we were given a few weeks to create this concept. But uh, after, I think it was about two months, one of the helicopters did actually crash into a wire. It was coming down into a field, and the heli the, there's a gate at the end of the field. The blue lights, the ambulance was blinking the far side of the gate, and there's a crowd around the ambulance, and the helicopter came in into the wind. What they didn't see was a single wire cutting across the field between trees over there, trees over here. No poles visible, just came in, just touched it. So we were asked then, could we make life a bit safer for the service by layering in the wires? So about six months of negotiation with, with, with the uh, ESB networks, lo and behold, the wires, wires appeared. But to get that to happen took a lot of effort and thought, and we had to take away all the underground wires and all the on-ground wires, all the boxes that they used in the ESB to provide services. So that was you know, an effort. As a result is, we've, we provide information to make things safer for that service. We also locate phones if, um, if a person rings up for an emergency call. We know the, the, the dispatchers to actually locate the phone through a little device as well. Oops. So in summary then, um, th this is effectively an Irish solution to an, Irish, to an international problem of using data. We, we believe we've been in innovative and we've got tremendous people working with us inside our own space and outside our own space. Um, the agency owns it entirely. So we've got total in-house control of the software. It's iterative, in other words, we don't plan something perfect for the start. We actually evolve it over time, which is kind of unique. And that's quite challenging for ICT development purposes, but we find it's absolutely vital in our world. It is clinically led, therefore clinically relevant. The data remains in Ireland. We use encryption where we can, security, transfer of data, et cetera, et cetera. It has a bottom-up and top-down design built into it. But over coffee, you can explore data to inform quite important decisions. It's got tremendous teaching potential, tremendous research potential, and indeed international potential, because it's open source. So effectively, through simple, sensible analysis and display, we want to produce 
clear, clean signals of interest that can be acted upon. And the evolution depends on the pressure of the day. So just two sides of messages. <clears throat> One is, don't be put off by the size of data. I heard, I heard the term big data, and the lads explain what it is. I was never too impressed by big data or little data. Don't be put off. The computers are designed to hack big data. Two, health data is characterized by huge variance and um, variety, which is a bit of, bit of a challenge. So you have to know your data pretty well. Access to these silos can be the biggest challenge, actually, at the moment in this country, in my opinion. But analysis of data sets can be simplified, customized. I think I've shown you that, I hope. Good healthcare, actually, I would suggest to you, is patient-centered data with shared care. The advent of the HR that's been mentioned by lads this morning offers massive potential if it's, if it's used right and designed right and deployed correctly. But there's no, no need to wait for that to happen as such. Unfortunately, unfortunately, data protection and GDPR can be weaponized in the interest of not sharing data. I think the Scali report, in terms of vital check, did point the finger at a number of agencies for not collaborating sharing data in interest of patients, so I think we should learn from that. And we must evolve solutions to reassociate data that makes it patient-centric over time, to bring back this stardust to the same patient. So uh, Health Atlas Ireland is a solution to some of these issues. And it's limited by your, its use is limited by your own imagination. And the final take home messages are as follows. Um, we would suggest the best way to exploit the potential available data is two things. You need a kind of governance group to oversee that, the, that you do the right thing. And that really means the business owner sponsor is right behind it. Right behind in terms of its deployment out into, into the hospitals, the community, and its implementation by the staff out there. That's, like, that's a quite a high, high task, or high ask. So here's, my, here's the governance group, and here's the, <clears throat> the scientific team. Here's myself dressed up. Um, so we could just call it ADST for, I mean, you could call it lots of other things. But it's ourselves, the business, the clinical people, the technical people, and the software people coming together to figure out what the dickens can we do with the data that we have in front of us. So we have to do the spec, do the maths, do the optics. So these are real subject matter experts in all these areas. And we weren't one thing above all else, you must think backwards. You must think backwards. Don't start with your data, start with the end result. So I would like into an Airfix kit or a logo box. So you must have a vision of where you want to end up. That's the box. What do you want to see at the end of the day? Secondly, all the parts must be put there in front of you on the table. All the parts. And you must have the instruction sheet on how to put them together again in the right order. In terms of Airfix, you obviously need a bit of glue. With Lego, Lego, you clip them together. But that's basically the concept. And that's hard to get across to people, this abstract concept of working backwards, putting all down there on the table before you start. But that's an essential concept of what we learned the last 10 years. So the future, I would suggest to you, is the reassociation of health data to make it truly patient-centric and diagnostic-specific as well where identifiable data can be used to support patient care in the individual or the group context, and de-identified data, as we heard from Scotland, can be used for QA, QA, QI, planning, research, etc. But we must have a governance and infrastructure to enable both to operate safely and properly. Thank you.